If you're studying for your ATPLs and having a little bit of trouble with instrumentation, then this is the place to be. Over the next few months, we're gonna be breaking down all the topics within the instrumentation subject, analyzing them, and hopefully making them make sense for you in time for the exam. Hi, I'm Grant, and welcome to the first in a new series all about instrumentation. There's lots of different things that we can measure on board an aircraft and analyze to make certain decisions about where we need to go, how high we need to fly, and various other things. The most fundamental and easy to understand though is temperature and time. So we're gonna start with them and slowly build up in complexity throughout the remainder of this course. We need to sense the temperature of various components so they don't overheat. And we also need to sense the temperature of the air around us to make sure we know when to turn on any anti-ice systems and avoid any ice buildup. We can measure temperature in uh, Celsius, Fahrenheit, or even Kelvin. It doesn't really matter, and the temperature probe will be calibrated to one of these, and then it can convert it if necessary, or can do the conversions manually, just like I've got up the top here. So you've got Kelvin plus 273 equals Celsius. Celsius times nine over five plus 32 equals the Fahrenheit. The simplest form of temperature sensor is to use a bimetallic sensor. This is where we use two different metals spiraled together, and when the temperature rises, one metal will expand more than the other, which basically unwinds the spiral and rotates a needle on a display. This is the sort of thing that you might use to measure air temperature on a small aircraft, but you can't really measure the temperature of engine components and display the information in a useful place because this bimetallic strip can only be so long. If you wanted to measure the temperature of the exhaust and you wanted the display in the cockpit, you need a bimetallic strip that went all the way to the back of the engine where the exhaust temperature was, for example. So simple, robust, very easy to understand, but not that useful for measuring some things, but can be used in very simple applications. A resistance temperature detector relies on a metal that will change in resistance when heated. Four resistors are set up in this format, essentially making a parallel circuit with a small battery outputting a consistent current. The values of these three resistors are known, and then this one down here is the variable resistance one. As the resistance of this one changes, it means that the voltage passing through this side of the parallel circuit measured at this point, V2, will be different from the midpoint here at V1. This resistor setup is fairly common in electronics and it's called a Wheatstone bridge if you're interested and want to look up more. Because there is a difference in voltage between the two midpoints, it means that if we place a wire between point V1 and V2, we'll see that a current flows. We can then use that current flow to turn a dial on a display and the dial will turn based on how much resistance there is because of how much voltage difference there is and that resistance changes depending on how much temperature there is. So the temperature changes the resistance, changes the voltage, changes the voltage difference, turns the dial, gives us an effective display. It's a good setup and allows for the measurement of components from far away, as all we need are longer wires to the uh, display dial. It does, however, need a constant DC power supply to make it work. Thermocouples are used for very hot elements and work using a principle called thermo EMF, thermoelectromagnetic force. This is when a metal creates a small voltage or electromagnetic force when a temperature difference exists between two parts of the metal. Basically, say this is a metal rod, if it's hot over on the right hand side and cold over on the left hand side, a small voltage is produced in this metal, simple. In a thermocouple, we use two different metals. We use uh, metal one, let's just call it, and metal two in two sensing elements. We also have a reference cold temperature. This means we get a voltage difference produced when sensing a temperature, which causes a current to flow. Essentially, we use that thermo EMF. We've got a hot and a cold, a hot and a cold. We get a voltage generated in metal one and a voltage generated in metal two. Because they're two different metals, 
that means that we're going to have a voltage difference and then we do the same thing that we did in the uh, resistance temperature detector and we hook up a dial and use the voltage difference and that current that's generated to turn the dial. Um, these are very effective because we can measure components from very far away just like we did with the uh, resistance temperature detector and it also doesn't need any power supply. The problem is they aren't hugely accurate so you wouldn't be, be using these for precision stuff but depending on the metals used for the thermocouples they can measure things at a very high temperature such as exhaust gas temperature in jet engines. Air temperature is one of the most important things to measure so that we can turn on any anti-icing systems when the temperature requires us to do so. In light aircraft that travel at low speed, we tend to use a bimetallic type of temperature probe with the end of the gauge poking out into the airflow and the dial giving us readings within the cockpit. It's simple and effective, but we run into a problem when we start to go faster. Basically, as all the little particles in the air pass over the probe, they rub against it and create friction, causing the probe to heat up. This distorts the results and doesn't give us a true reading because we get this sort of kinetic heating effect whilst we're traveling through the air. We therefore measure something that we call a total air temperature or TAT. And this is different from the actual air temperature, which is the static air temperature, or sometimes referred to as the outside air temperature. So you get SAT, OAT and TAT. That's a bit confusing. And basically, when we add friction to the static air temperature, we then are going to be measuring the total air temperature. So how do we solve this problem? Well, we use clever design. The most common type of probe and clever design that is used to get around this problem is called a rose mount probe, which is, I'm pretty sure, a brand name. But uh, this style, with a little variation, is all over the place on different aircraft. What happens in these probes is that air passes through this chamber past a small heater, which kind of seems a bit counterintuitive, but it's there to stop any ice formation on the front of this probe. The venturi that follows the opening draws some of the air down into a sensing chamber, while the heavier particles that are in there, like water or ice, don't get drawn in and are free to pass by and they don't get sucked down into the sensing chamber. In the chamber, a resistance type temperature probe detects the heat of the air before that air is dumped out the back of the probe. The separate chamber eliminates most of the effects of the anti-icing heaters in the probe entry and we can therefore get a reading for total air temperature that is accurate and isn't affected by any need to de-ice or anti-ice the probe and it also gets rid of all the particles in the air for a more accurate reading as well. It's important to note that this sort of probe will only work properly when it's moving through the air or has air moving through it. So when stationary, the air temperature readings will be way off and very, very high, especially if you've got uh, the hot sun beating down on the probe, for example. So we've got our measure for true air temperature, but we want to know the outside air temperature or the uh, static air temperature. What we do is we then use an equation or more specifically, there'll be a little bit of electronics that does this calculation for you. The equation that we use is the static air temperature equals the total air temperature divided by 1 plus 0.2 times the recovery factor times the max squared. The equation has a few things to note. It must be used with Kelvin, first of all, which confuses things because sometimes the recovery factor gets given the symbol K. And the recovery factor is essentially a measure of how efficient the probe is thermodynamically, as this equation is a thermodynamic expression for how much heat is added to the air by the speed we are going through, hence the Mach number. So let's just put some numbers in this and talk through an example. So let's say we want to find out the outside air temperature, the static air temperature, and we have the following information. We've got a total air temperature is uh, minus 40. That's what we measured. And we've got a recovery factor of uh, 0.9. 
and we've got a Mach number of 0.75. And we want to find out what is the static air temperature. So the first thing we need to do is to convert it into Kelvin. So we're going to add 273, and that gives us an answer of 233. So it'd be 233 Kelvin divided by 1 plus uh, 0.2 times 0 0.9 times 0 0.75 squared. Um, we'll just leave that in there for now. And then I'll go away and do that on a calculator and see that we've got 233 divided by 1.10125 dot 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 giving us a final answer in Kelvin of 211.57 Kelvin. And if we wanted to convert that, so let's just do it back over here. So we've got 211.57 Kelvin. We want to convert that back into um, Celsius. So we take away 273 and we get an answer. So that's, uh, yes, yeah, Celsius is here. That's gonna give us minus 61. Yeah, 61. So we can see that the friction of us traveling through the air, we're going from minus 61 actual outside air temperature, and we're adding about 20 degrees of friction to get us up to the total air temperature of minus 40. So it has a big effect whilst we're traveling at relatively high Mach numbers. In aviation, we measure things in UTC, Universal Time Coordinate, which is a standardized time zone throughout the world. In the UK and parts of Europe, it is the same as the time in London, GMT, without daylight savings applied. And in other parts, it might be a few hours different from local or even vastly different in places like New Zealand, where UTC is 12 hours different from local time. Basically, things can get confusing if you're referencing times to aviation-related things like weather reports and arrival times, which are all in UTC, and then using your watch or phone, which might be in local time, especially when flying across different time zones with your phone maybe auto-updating the time as you arrive in each place. So to save us and help us with that confusion, we have a clock on the plane which is set to UTC time for referencing all these things like weather reports and arrival times, etc. And we call this the system clock. We use this as our time source when we are flying. These system clocks are the same as your wristwatch, usually a quartz-based timekeeping device uh, on smaller aircraft, with larger aircraft having more complicated clocks with various features, and they can use a GPS source to get an accurate time from the atomic clock on board the satellites up in space. They will also feature other things like a chrono, which is a stopwatch used for timing short things. For example, we need the engines to run at idle for at least three minutes before shutting them down after landing. So we'd want to start the chrono shortly after landing to ensure we have uh, achieved that three minute cooldown time. We also have the elapsed time, which we can use for longer timing typically for uh, the time of pushback to the time of pulling stand on get, pulling back on stand again to get the block time of a flight, which is the flight time plus taxiing. Or we could use to record just the flight time by selecting it on just before takeoff and off just before, just after landing, sorry. Another important use for an onboard system clock is to get an accurate measurement for how long the engine has been running and the plane in general has been running. Engines have parts that need to be checked after a certain number of hours. So what we can do is we can manually record the startup and shutdown times in a tech log using the system clock. And then we can get an accurate measurement of how long the engine has been running for and how often we need to service the parts and when we need to service and check all of the components of the engine. Most aircraft will not rely on manually noting down the times though, and they'll have a dedicated odometer that starts running when the engine starts and stops when the engine stops. This gives an accurate figure of how many hours the engine has been running for 
and it's kind of like the total mileage or total kilometerage uh, odometer that you get on a car, which gives an accurate figure of how long the engine has been on for and maintenance can be planned according to the figures on this odometer. In summary then, you've got temperature sensing in a few different ways. Most simple is a bimetallic strip. You've got two different metals. They untwine at different rates when heat is applied and the unspinning of one causes uh, faster than the other causes a dial to move and we can measure temperature. Simple, but the biometallic strip uh, limits how long it can be and how far away it can be from the source. You get resistive type elements that use a Wheatstone bridge setup. The variable resistance reacts to heat and you'll get more or less heat, uh, uh, heat and more or less resistance according to that heat. You then get a voltage difference generated between each side of the uh, Wheatstone bridge. That voltage difference creates a current. That current can be used to turn a dial. Um, they're good. They do rely on having a power source, but it means that we can uh, take this display and just attach some wires and send it to the cockpit away from the source of the temperature that we're measuring. You also get thermocouples which have the benefit of not needing power. They generate voltage when there's a temperature difference uh, along their length. So it's gonna be hot over here, and it's gonna be cold over here, and that generates a voltage in this one metal. In this second metal, because it's a slightly different metal, it means there's a slightly different voltage generated, and we get two different voltages, AKA a voltage difference. Voltage difference means current can flow, and we can use that flowing current to turn a dial which is proportional to the voltage difference and therefore proportional to the temperature and we get an accurate measurement of temperature in the cockpit. For air temperature sensing we generally on big aircraft use a rose mount probe. It's good because it means it's not going to ice up because there's heating elements here and then we draw air down into this sensing chamber and use a resistive type element to sense the temperature of the total air temperature. And we get rid of all the particles of water and stuff in the air that might really affect and deform this, um, the result of the total air temperature. We then use uh, electronics. Uh, we use a, an algorithm to calculate out what the static air temperature is compared to the total air temperature. The formula is static air temperature or outside air temperature equals the total air temperature divided by one plus 0.2 times the recovery factor times the Mach squared. Uh, these temperatures are in Kelvin. The recovery factor is a measurement of how efficient the resistive element and this uh, system in general is, and sometimes can be given the symbol K, and then Mach is your Mach number, which is gonna be a measurement of how fast this air is flowing through the probe and how fast you're traveling through the air. So a few things to remember with this equation, but it's a good way of figuring out the outside air temperature versus the total air temperature. We also need to measure the time. Time is very easy to understand. It's UTC time, which is the universal uh, worldwide time zone. Everything in aviation is referenced to UTC. So instead of using your watch where the local time might be vastly different to UTC. You can use the system clock, which is always set to UTC for all uh, aviation related things. And we can use accurate times from this to note down how long the engine's been running. And um, then we know how often we have to service those parts and when we need to service those parts.